The book of Acts in the Bible. The book of Acts is all full of stories of Christians taking the gospel message of Jesus and proclaiming it to others. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preaches a sermon to the whole city of Jerusalem. Stephen preaches Jesus to the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. Philip takes it to the Gentile city of Samaria and then to the eunuch from Ethiopia. Paul takes it to Turkey, to Greece, to Rome. The book of Acts is also full of stories of the gospel message of Jesus producing results. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 are added to the church. The Ethiopian eunuch takes the gospel to Egypt and North Africa. Every major city in Turkey and Greece ends up having a church, and there's one in Rome as well. But the book of Acts is also full of stories of how the gospel message of Jesus disrupted people's lives. Again and again we're told when the gospel came to a city, the whole city and the authorities were disturbed by it. That's what we find in Thessalonica. We're told that they said, these men who have turned the whole world upside down, they've come here also. And that's really the one main point we want to take away from this sermon text. When the gospel of Jesus comes into people's lives, it disrupts them. It turns their world upside down. Paul knew that the gospel message of Jesus, that it was a disruptive message. Do you know how he knew that? Because it disrupted his life. One day, he went from the leader of the movement to kill Christians and get rid of the gospel of Jesus to the next day being the leader of the movement that was preaching the gospel of Jesus. Talk about a disrupted life. You see, Paul knew that the gospel of Jesus was difficult to understand and difficult to embrace. So Luke, it's interesting, Luke highlights Paul's approach to the gospel message. Did you catch the four verbs he used? He said Paul ex reasoned with them, he explained it, he proved it, and he proclaimed it. In other words, Paul was very thoughtful and reasoned with his approach with the gospel. And that tells us two things. It tells us that faith isn't opposed to reason or thinking. It tells us that for adults, coming to faith is going to involve thinking and reasoning. Now, don't misunderstand. When the Holy Spirit brings someone to faith, it's all his doing. And it's a light switch. There's no process you either are an unbeliever or you're a believer. But often, that Holy Spirit working through the gospel message of law and gospel, it takes time. As the Holy Spirit works, people think and they process what they're thinking. So here's my question. If Paul was so thoughtful and careful in his approach to bringing the gospel, why were the people in Thessalonica so upset with him. It wasn't anything about Paul, how he looked or how he acted. What disrupted them was the content of the message Paul brought. Listen again. He said, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. That's what was so disruptive about the gospel message. Three words. It was necessary. That same phrase is used of Jesus in Luke 24. Do you remember he's walking on the road to Emmaus with two of his disciples? But they have no idea it's Jesus because they can't just imagine that there would be a suffer that would a, a Messiah that would have to suffer and die for them. And he says this to them: How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? and then enter his glory? 
Do you see how the whole Bible leads to one necessary conclusion only? The necessity of a suffering Savior. God had to send His Son. It was necessary for Him to send Him to live in our place. To be perfect in our place. To die on the cross to take away our sins. And that's what's so disruptive. Because that goes against, it turns upside down the message that the world wants to hear. When it comes to getting right with God and getting to heaven, the message the world wants to hear is that it's all about you and what you have to do. Think about it this way. If Paul came into Thessalonica and said this, I, I want to show you how to live a better moral life, that wouldn't have disrupted anything. Because they heard that before. Or if Paul came into Thessalonica and said, um, I want to show you how to be more religious and get spiritual. That wouldn't have been disruptive. Many religions were talking about that. But Paul came into Thessalonica and said, I want to tell you about your need for someone named Jesus, the suffering Savior. It was necessary for God to come down to this earth. Why? Because we are sinful. You are sinful. And that sin you have has ruined your relationship with God. Worse than that, it's put you under God's curse of going to hell. And there's nothing you can do about that. So God did something. He sent Jesus to live for you and to die for you. And all you have to do is simply believe in what Jesus did for you. And that's a message that my sinful nature and your sinful nature and Satan doesn't want to hear. That it's all up to God and he had to do everything. It's interesting. One of our members sent me a quote from Martin Luther this week, just randomly, and it fit perfectly with what this text is saying. Here's the quote. The sin underneath all other sins is to trust the lie of Satan that we can't trust the love and grace of Jesus and we got to take matters into our own hands. And we do just that, don't we? On a small scale, when I've got problems and issues in my life, your life, don't you want to take them into your own hands instead of leave them in God's hands, right? And then we do that sometimes with our soul salvation, thinking it's got to be in my hands too. You see how the gospel message is a disruptive message? And so it shouldn't be a surprise that it disrupts people's lives, right? Look in Thessalonica. There was only two responses to the gospel, right? They were either for it or against it. There's no neutral ground. You're either for it or against it. And why were some of the Jews and Greeks against that gospel message? It upset their status quo. We're told that Jews and a great many of the Greeks and women believed. Jews, Gentiles, women, all on equal status with God? That was scandalous to Jews. We're also told that the talk was acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. Well, that upset the civic and social status quo of the Greeks. What about those that were for the message of Jesus? What happened to them? It disrupted their lives, didn't it? Jason, who was housing Paul and Silas, they formed a mob, a riot. We've seen pictures on TV, right? Can you imagine Jason's house? Windows all broken out, door broken out, all his possessions dragged from the house and thrown outside. He's arrested, taken before the authorities, and then he's got to post bail to guarantee that there'll be no more disturbances. Wow. Talk about a life being disrupted. Why was Jason willing to have his life so disrupted? Do you know why? Because that disruptive gospel message had disrupted his own life. Gone from Jason's life was all the guilt he had over sin. Gone was this constant stress of thinking he had to do enough good to earn God's favor. He knew that Jesus, his king, had fought all those victories for him. Gone was Jason's fear of death. 
because he knew his king rose from the dead. And it's the same for you and me, isn't it? Hasn't the gospel of Jesus disrupted your life? Gone from you is the guilt of your sin, right? Gone from your mind is the sound of Satan's soundtrack. You know, the one that says, I didn't do very good this week, so next week I better do better for Jesus. Gone from your life and my life is any fear of death. Death now is just this harmless bee. It buzzes around, but it can't bite us, it can't sting us, it can't kill us. Haven't your lives been completely disrupted by Jesus' gospel? And so it shows in our disrupted lives too, right? Every one of us here has someone we know that doesn't believe in Jesus or we don't know if they believe in Jesus and we want them to believe in Jesus. Every one of us has that. Maybe it's somebody really close to you, like a spouse, a child, a parent. Maybe it's somebody not so close, like a friend, uh, someone you work with or, or whatever. So what do you do? Your number one goal is to simply let them hear the gospel message because it is going to disrupt their lives in a good way. But that means that we first have to let our lives be disrupted. We have to get out of our comfort zone and be willing to just tell somebody there's a Savior they need. Just invite them to church, whether it's on Christmas or Easter. Invite them to a Bible information class and say, you're going to come with them. It doesn't matter. Just get them in front of that message. Let the Holy Spirit do His work and it'll disrupt their lives. Do you want a case in point? I'll give you an example. This member said I could share this story. His wife isn't a Christian, doesn't go to church except on Easter. And came this past Easter and after that he told me a couple weeks later, it was Saturday night and he was reading his Bible like he always does at night. And his wife just turned to him and said, you really believe that stuff, don't you? And he goes, yeah, I do. There's some parts I struggle with, but I believe it. Do you see how the disruptive mess gospel message has started to disrupt her life in a good way? I still remember 1990 when Brenda and I first arrived in Lusaka, Zambia, to be missionaries there. We got in a vehicle and we drove nine hours on the only highway that went east to this outpost city that we were living in. After a nine-hour ride over these potholes all over the place, we get to Chapada. Well, two days later, the power and water go out for seven days. They had the one power line going from the capital to our city, 400 miles of power line, well, out in the middle of the bush, the villagers decided that for their ox carts, they needed a few nuts and bolts here. And they figured, ah, taking some nuts and bolts off of these big pylons wasn't going to affect anything. So in the middle of nowhere, seven electric pylons fall down. And so that was our introduction to Africa, going down to a mosque to get water to drink and cooking macaroni and cheese over a wheelbarrow filled with charcoal. And so I'm going... What on earth is doing mission work going to be like in a place like this? And I still remember what an old missionary said to me. He goes, Joel, it's all about needing Jesus. Never stop needing Jesus. Isn't that what it's all about for you and me? We simply need Jesus. We can't do it ourselves. He did it all. But it's the same for those we love, our family members, our friends, those we work with. Never stop needing Jesus. Just tell them the gospel message, that they need Jesus. Is it a disruptive message? Yeah. Is it going to disrupt lives? Yeah. But always and only in a good way, right? Amen.